Facilities Development Command, Aviation and Missile Center. I will be presenting on characterization of composite spaced armor performance. Now, my fellow team members who worked on this presentation, this project, and the corresponding article with me are Daniel Camp, John Haler, and Delaney Jordan. Now, I wanted to give everyone a bit of background before moving forward. I'm not sure what level of familiarity everyone has with armor systems, but I'll try to cater to all knowledge levels. So, turning block composite spaced armor is an unconventional armor system that is capable of stopping armor-piercing projectiles at lower aerial densities. So spaced armor in general is an armor configuration made up of three major components. This can be seen in the top right image on the screen. These components are a striker, an air gap, and a catcher. So in this specific composite spaced armor, the striker is called turning block. Turning Block is a trade name and manufactured by a company called Hardwire. Now, the, the detailed construction of Turning Block is proprietary, and I can't talk about that in the presentation, but I can say that this armor panel is made up of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, and it works by imparting an asymmetrical load onto the round, which causes it to tumble. Next, the round travels through an air gap, the second component. And the larger the air gap, the more time there is for the bullet to tumble. This tumble on the round does two things. First, since we're dealing with armor piercing rounds, the hardened penetrator in the tip of the bullet is actually turned out of the shot line. This negate, negates the advantage of AP rounds, uh, since the penetrator must be in the shot line in order for AP rounds to work properly. Also, it increases the presented area of the projectile, and both of these in combination enable the third part of the armor system, the catcher, to attenuate enough energy to stop the round. And the catcher is also made of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. So in this presentation, I'll be referencing obliquity or the angle of the armor quite often. To be clear, Obliquity is in reference to the shot line along which the bullet is traveling. And in the middle image on your screen, uh, this will be referred to as zero degrees obliquity since the bullet is traveling along the path normal to the armor. And then the bottom image refers to 45 degrees obliquity, which is measured between that same line normal to the armor and the horizontal path of the bullet. So in previous testing, performance of this armor system was fairly consistent at zero degrees of liquidity. It was largely successful at turning the round as intended, which is why we were interested in this armor system to begin with. Traditional armor systems that are able to stop AP rounds typically exhibit a positive relationship between performance and obliquity. Now, this is due to the fact that performance is dependent on the apparent thickness, and as the armor angle increases, the bullet would have to pass through more armor material. So, for this reason, traditional armor systems are tested at zero degrees of liquidity, and all of the specs are written at zero degrees of liquidity, since this apparent thickness of the armor that the bullet sees is at a minimum here. However, Traditional armor systems are isotropic in nature, and composite-spaced armor is anisotropic, with its material properties varying throughout the panel. This caused us to wonder about the performance of the armor system at non-zero obliquity, and very limited testing has been previously done at these varying obliquities, so we thought it was really necessary to conduct these tests in order to fully characterize the performance of this armor system. So our team took it into our own hands to conduct testing on this composite spaced armor. We set out first and foremost to better understand how the armor angle or obliquity of the spaced armor system affected the tumble of the round, which in turn led us to know 
how the armor system performed at these varying obliquities overall. After ballistics testing was conducted, we made a point to analyze the high-speed video that we collected during these shots, which allowed us to visually see and measure in the video software, frame by frame, the angle of the round and distance traveled. Also, we aim to conduct and then analyze V50 test data. So for those of you that do not know, V50 is the velocity at which the armor has a 50% chance of stopping the threat. So we hoped that all of this data analysis would allow us to establish a specific confidence level for the performance of this armor at varying obliquities. So in previous testing of turning block composite faced armor at oblique angles, we had witnessed that at certain angles, the bullet consistently tumbled nose up, while at other angles, the bullet consistently tumbled nose down. So this limited testing that had been previously done led us to the following hypothesis, which we developed prior to our testing. So as obliquity varies, the tumble rate of the bullet changes. It is speculated that there will be a, an inflection point per se, small range of obliquities in which there will be no bullet tumble. This hypothesis was also informed by the fact that this armor system is anisotropic, as I stated previously. Before moving forward, I also want to touch on the information that I cannot talk about in this presentation and unfortunately cannot answer any questions related to any of the following due to their security classifications. Specifically, I cannot talk about the aerial density of the armor, the threat being tested, and the velocity of the round. Uh, but in order to still illustrate that the effect that velocity has on our results, the classified velocity, which refers to 100 meter standoff of this threat, will be referred to as the reference velocity. Now, any velocity that I mention from this point forward will be a delta or numerical difference from this reference velocity. So testing was conducted in Fort Eustis, Virginia at the indoor range of the U.S. Army CCDC AVMIC b tracks or Ballistics Test Range for air Aircraft Component Survivability. We specifically designed this fixture for oblique armor testing. This made it so we were easily able to modify the obliquity of both the turning block and the catcher, as well as the distance of the air gap. So here in the left image, you can see the turning block, the catcher, and the air gap. Also, we used two high-speed phantom cameras in order to record video. The bottom camera in the right image faced upwards and allowed us to measure the yaw of the bullet. And then the left side camera allowed us to measure the angle tumble on the round and also calculate the velocity as a function of distance. In addition to these two cameras, a velocity screen was used, which is not shown in these images, but we used that to measure the muzzle velocity of the round. So we specifically conducted two different types of tests, the first being V50. As I said earlier, V50 tests are conducted to find the velocity in which 50% of the bullets are complete penetrations and 50% are partial penetrations. The higher the V50, the faster the bullet can be and still be stopped, which is desirable. For those of you who do not know, a partial penetration is a term in the armor community that equates to a successful stop of the round, but one when some damage has occurred. A complete penetration, on the other hand, means that the armor has failed to stop the round and penetrates the back face of the armor system. So the parameters for these V50 tests are turning block, a six inch air gap, a catcher, and varying velocity in accordance with the mil specs for V50. So since a catcher was in place for all of these tests, we were able to visually see if the shot resulted in a complete or partial penetration through inspection of the armor panels actually afterwards. This graphic on the screen 
represents the data that we collected throughout. Each of the snapshots of the bullet turning represents a frame in our software where we were able to measure angles, tumble, distance traveled, and then calculate the velocity on the round. And to be clear, distance traveled is specifically in reference to after leaving the turning block. Then for this second set of tests, we removed the catcher. This was purposeful so that we could see the performance past the six inch air gap. All of these shots were executed at the classified reference velocity, which we were able to do by modifying the grain input on the round and obliquity was varied throughout these tests. This allowed us to specifically evaluate the angle of tumble as a function of distance traveled and armor obliquity without velocity being a variable. Uh, throughout these testing graphs that I'll slow in the next, show in the next few slides, partial penetrations are represented in green and complete penetrations will be represented in red. We were able to use the data from the first V50 test that we conducted to inform when one of these shots without a catcher would have been a partial penetration or would have been a complete penetration. So first we executed V50 testing at zero degrees of liquidity. So these two graphs correspond to the same shots and the same tests, but they show two different things. On the left, the relationship between angle tumble and distance traveled is shown. Each dot represents one of those frames in our high-speed video software that I was referencing earlier. All of these frames in a given shot are connected by a line. We found here that the relationship between the angle of tumble and the distance traveled is fairly linear trend, meaning that the turning block actually imparts a constant tumble rate on the round. Also, the partial penetrations seem to have constantly higher angle of tumbles shown in green towards the top of the graph, which is also in line with the theory behind spaced armor, uh, so nothing unexpected here. On the right, each shot is represented by one point. The graphs illustrate, or this graph illustrates the relationship between velocity, which again is, at, is the delta from the reference velocity, and the angle of tumble at five inches which is right before impacting the catcher. Overall, it appears that as velocity increases, or as the tumble gets closer to zero, more complete penetrations occur, which again is in line with space armor theory, so nothing unexpected. We would love to, at some point, be able to fill out these graphs a little bit more with more data points at some point in the future to maybe show a stronger trend line here uh, it'd be particularly interesting to get some points in between the area of the complete penetrations and the partials on the velocity graph on the right. Uh, we believe that'll likely be a zone of mixed results where we see some completes and some partials. Overall, at zero degrees, we found that the V50 to be a delta of 5.8 feet per second from the reference velocity. So this is the exact V50 that we were expecting since Hardwire designed this armor system to have this specific V50. Then we conducted V50 testing at 45 degrees of liquidity. The first thing you may notice is that this is a negative slope, indicating that the bullet tumbled consistently nose down, whereas at zero degrees of liquidity, the bullet tumbled consistently nose up. Interestingly enough, the V50 improved from zero degrees, and we actually got a delta of 147.3 feet per second from the reference velocity. Now, this is in line with the theory of traditional armor systems that I was discussing earlier, that as the apparent thickness increases with obliquity, that performance will also increase. But out of 10 shots of this V50, one of them exhibited almost no tumble at all, which can be seen as the horizontal line box towards the top of the left-hand graph with nearly no slope. 
So this made us believe that we were onto something. On the right, we can still clearly see that as the velocity increases and as the angle gets closer to zero, the round is more difficult to stop. So after completing the B50 tests, we moved on to the second type of test testing where catchers were removed. And I want to remind you all that these V50 tests actually informed the second type of testing without catchers because we found based on analyses that in our V50 testing, 100% of shots with at least plus or minus 40 degrees of tumble or partial penetrations and 100% of shots with less than plus or minus 30 degrees of tumble for complete penetration. In between these angles, the results were uncertain, uh, but these metrics, which are coded in green and red accordingly, help us to quantify the test without catchers, which I will go back to now. So we decided to repeat testing at zero and 45 degrees of liquidity to get additional data points here and see what the results would be past that six inch air gap. Again, the positive slope at zero degrees of liquidity versus the negative slope at 45 indicates that they were consistently tumbling in opposite directions. So all of the armor panels were mounted consistently the same. So this is an inherent characteristic of the armor system. Then we conducted these tests at 30 and 35 degrees of liquidity. The average rate of tumble has decreased some at 30 and then even more at 35. Many more of those shots with little to no tumble are present and can be seen as the horizontal lines largely in the red areas of the graph. Also similarly to at zero degrees, both of these consistently tumbled nose up. At this point, we speculated we were getting close to that hypothesized inflection point here. So then we conducted this test at 40 degrees, and it was clear that we had found the inflection point because some of these rounds tumbled slightly nose down, but the majority of them had no tumble at all which can be seen as the horizontal lines in the red on the left graph. Since this performance was very unique, we decided to attempt conducting a V50, which can be shown on the right. Uh, we initially set the air gap to six inches, but within four shots, we were only able to accomplish complete penetration. Even after we lowered the velocity to a delta of 765 feet per second below the reference. So at this point, we attempted to increase the air gap to 10 inches, but almost no tumble occurred here, which can be seen as the top line in the graph on the right. At this point, we concluded the test because it was clear that the inflection point had been found and was at 40 degrees. So on to conclusions. At normal obliquity, this armor performs as intended and is able to effectively tumble the armor piercing round at much lower weights than traditional systems. Typically, in order to defeat AP threats, a hardened strike face, usually made of ceramic, is needed. Whereas this armor system provides a very realistic solution to defeating AP rounds on weight-sensitive platforms like rotorcraft. There does appear to be an inflection point, however, where there is almost no tumble of the round at or, nor at or near 40 degrees of liquidity. And this degraded performance can be found between 30 and 40 degrees as well. So this confirmed our initial hypothesis that there would be a small range of obliquities in which that tumble would be reduced. Overall, a major takeaway from this is that we can no longer assume that 
testing at zero or normal degrees of liquidity will represent the worst case scenario. This, this way of thinking was developed for isotropic armor systems and really cannot be applied to an anisotropic composite space armor system. So we realized it's of the utmost importance to understand the mechanism of defeat to fully characterize the armor performance. So there are certain tasks that we've identified that we would like to pursue in the future. First, we want to test this armor system at as many obliquities as possible. While we were able to test many of them. There are still some that we haven't gotten to that we'd like to. Uh, and we really just want to be able to have data on a comprehensive angle sweep. Also, we'd like to repeat testing on the obliquities that we've already tested just to increase the confidence levels at each obliquity. Next, we also want to test the ability of this armor system to stop even higher order threats, um, possibly by increasing the aerial density of the turning block. Perhaps most importantly, we really want to publicize the enhanced capability that this armor system represents, since it really does represent a new, effective, lightweight class of armor. And last but not least, we want to assist in improving the off-angle performance of this armor system. As I have said before throughout this whole presentation, we believe that this armor system is very promising. There's just a small range of obliquities with no tumble. And we, we think that these could be potentially mitigated through system level design. Hopefully in the future, we'll see composite space armor being implemented to greatly improve survivability on various platforms such as Army Rotorcraft. And that is all I had prepared. So at this point, I think we will switch over to Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. So, yes, we will jump into some questions and answers. Um, there are a couple that are already in queue, and so I will bring them up. I encourage anybody who hasn't submitted their question yet to go ahead and use the Q&A feature. It should be the top middle of your screen where you can enter that. All right. So first one here, and they will appear on the screen, and I'll also repeat them just for those who are just simply dialed in. Uh, first question, do you see this work as being applicable? to hardening against catastrophic turbine engine failure with whirling blade fragments as penetrators? I think this question actually might be best for John since John is on the engines TA at our organization. John, would you be able to go for this one? Yeah, I'm happy to answer it. Um, this system would probably work to stop uh, those penetrators, but it wouldn't it might not be the best suited for it it is more likely that it it would be suited to protect an engine from outside threat as opposed to while it, be, it would be capable of stopping the fragments um, the fragments aren't necessarily going to be of any particular shape um, so the tipping portion of it uh, may or may not be helpful depending upon the fragment size Okay, great, thanks. Appreciate that, John. All right, let's jump to the next question. What kind of cameras and frame rates were used to capture the tumble angles? So the cameras were phantom cameras, if you're familiar with those. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the exact frame rate of it was. It was very high frame rate, so we were able to get uh, roughly so, five or so frames. Oh, you, John, do you remember? It was. Yes, it was the Phantom B2512, and um, we shouldn't give them the exact frame rate. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, there's some things we cannot go into with Q&A in this portion, but uh, if you are very interested, feel free to contact us for further information. Fair enough. Thanks. All right. Let's jump to the next question here. All right, how practical is it to maintain an air gap of as big as six inches in an armored structure? How is the turning block connected to the catcher? 
Is there a support frame connecting the two? And will that support frame itself have an effect on the penetration resistance? So a number of questions in that question. Yeah, quite a few questions. So I think it's definitely very practical. We've worked with various contractors and six inches is a, a reasonable space um, to allocate for an armor system. They say that really up to, up to 10 inches, which is an arbitrary number that some people differentiate on, but up to 10 inches is really about as much armor space that we could allocate to the aircraft for the system. And then let's see, is there a support frame? John, do you want to go into the rest of this question? Yeah, sure. Yes, there's a support frame which uh, supports the armor and actually houses it. This depends upon the application. So for instance, if you're putting it into a floor, that will there will be a different type of style of application than if you're, say, doing a, a cover around another a structure or an engine, something like that. Um, and boundary conditions always matter for these armors. So it, it, it does very much matter how you actually uh, support the uh, armor panels or the, the material inside of that frame. Uh, so that will have an effect. I'd also like to add that in um, one particular possible use case for this armor system is in our, an integration into an aircraft skin and floor, because there's typically a gap between the skin and floor, and there will be wires and pass-throughs and connectors running in that gap, but that's already there and it's already inherent. And it is about six to eight inches in most army helicopters. So um, even though that space may be filled, it, it won't really do anything except attenuate some energy of the bullet. So um, that's one area where it is practical to maintain an air gap for, you know, if you can imagine belly and, and sometimes um, side structure. Yeah, really we found that a minimum of four inches um, is acceptable for these armor systems and up to up to 10 inches depending on which platform we're talking about but overall that air gap is much more appealing than having it uh, filled and, and weighted down Does that answer that question So yes, this, this does have multi-hit capability. Um, I'm not sure if this is something that we should discuss in this platform. Anyone else have an opinion on whether or not we should go into that here? We can discuss further offline. Yeah, okay, that's, that's what I was thinking. If uh, anyone has questions about this, let's discuss this one further offline. So this is this is going into the specifics of the construction of turning block, um, which is hardwire proprietary. Um, so this one we we really can't even go into offline, unfortunately. Um, so hardwire owns all of the data rights on this. They may be willing to discuss it with you, though. Yeah, yeah. If you contact hardwire specifically, they would very possibly be willing to discuss. These, um, these systems are typically uh, polymer, at least the, the type of material that's being used. Yeah, we were saying that a lot of the traditional systems are ceramic, but for, for ours are more so polymer based. Is there a minimum gap required for the system to be effective for aircraft real estate is severely limited restricting its application? Yeah, so, um, oh, sorry, still need to go for it. I think you already talked a bit to this one, Sierra. Mm -hmm, yeah, I was saying four inches is typically 
what we've seen, at least in our past testing, is the minimum effective uh, distance, uh, but up to 10 inches is what a lot of platforms are, are willing to allocate. As Delaney was saying, that especially in the floor system where they already have that, you know, space filled with wires, um, they it doesn't have to be completely empty. Um, but I think a lot of people, a lot of platforms, this is a realistic um, air gap length. It'll also change based on your thread and you know, what you're trying to stop. Very good. All right. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, will there be a test with FSP, for, well, fragment simulating projectiles? Uh, at this point, we don't know what the next tests will hold. We'll still, we're still trying to uh, acquire funding and uh, determine what the next test will be, but I'm sure at some point we'd love to test things like that in the future. Perfect. All right. Uh, is there any data on this on this armor that has been deployed in the field for long periods and might have experienced any sort of degradation? Short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's fair enough. Okay, keeping it moving. What kind of an air gap would you be using integration on a platform for this threat? Uh, so, so six inches. Oh, sorry. Yes, Celine? Uh, I was sort of mentioning that we would um, try to integrate and use the available space. So currently on aircraft, that's six to eight inches on, on Army helicopters. Um, but as Sierra said, you can go down to four or up to 10 and still be effective. All right, perfect. Next question. Uh, do any models for this armor, reduced order or high performance computing exist? No, and that's an area that um, is very much open to exploration. Okay, uh, next question. So are you able to disclose the type of penetrator? For example, ball, armor, piercing, or FSP? Small, medium, or large caliber? Uh, so yeah, but this is armor piercing rounds, and that's a major benefit of this armor system is that it, it moves that armor piercing penetrator out of the shot line. Okay, good. All right, let's jump to the next question. We got a, quite a few questions, which is which is good. So I'd like to make sure we can respond as many as possible. So next question, is there a chance that other factors besides aerial density could be optimized? For example, matrix slash fiber interfacial properties or other properties affecting the ply yield or failure? There's a lot to op optimize in this system. Um, not only how you create the tumble and um, effectively put in the forces necessary for that, but as well the boundary conditions about how you uh, form the armor in the actual structural frame. Um, there, there are many other properties. Okay. Um, the next question here, and I think we sort of just uh, alluded to this, but are you planning to do any numerical simulations? I don't think we have anything currently planned, um, but as I was saying for the other question about planned work, really all of this is, is something that we'd love to do in the future um, and hope to publicize any future work uh, and research that we do on it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I believe again, you might have already addressed this, but is the catcher part of the armor system or is it just used to catch the bullet and assess the tumble during test? Yeah, the, the catcher is a part of the armor system. It's, it's kind of, well, I wouldn't say the most important part, but it basically is 
what differentiates between a complete and a partial penetration since after inspection of that you can see whether or not it broke through the back surface of the catcher. So that is what ultimately is the last defense of the armor system uh, uh, before the bullet passes through. The reason we did test without a catcher was because you can vary that air gap and we wanted to be able to assess the performance at different air gaps without using a catcher and doing multitudes and, and multiplications of our um, physical shots. It was a cost saving method. Yeah, it was, it was two part, cost saving and also basically being able to see the performance as large of an air gap as possible. And since we were able to analyze those B50 tests in the beginning, we had a pretty clear understanding of, of how much tumble would equate to a partial versus a complete penetration. So those tests were still very useful to us without the catching. Very good. Okay, that makes yeah, make sense. So let's see. next question. Um, are you going to study V1 velocity? So the 1% probability or lower. V50 velocities can sometimes be misleading when making comparisons of performance. Uh, that's, that's a good question. I think that's something that we may consider doing in the future. Uh, again, we don't have any finite plans for anything moving forward right now, um, but that, that's a good point and something we'll probably keep in mind. Typically in the armor community, V50 is used to compare different armors, and, and that's why it's traditionally a metric that's used um, for a real system to further gain a confidence interval. A lot of times, uh, someone will use a 80% confidence level or, um, or even a 90-10 confidence interval. Yep, perfect, okay, uh, next question. So in addition to the projectile rounds, has there been any blast wave testing on this system? Not that we've seen. Um, it's possible Hardwire has done extra testing um, on their own systems, but we haven't done any. Okay. Next question. So people have been proposing armor of ceramic spheres in matrix and space panels. That was proposed for helicopter cargo area floors. How is this armor different? Unfortunately, we can't discuss the difference between the system and other systems um, because that is too close to the armor construction, which is proprietary. Hmm. We can say that both the turning block and the catcher are made of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, and that's, that's about all I should really say. Fair enough, but I, I suspect again, if this person, if, if Tom would like to do a talk with you guys, you, you have some more you could say offline about comparisons. Yeah, yes, definitely. All right, next question. So, uh, in the previous program, uh, we've been able to achieve 7.6 pounds per square foot uh, for a rotorcraft API threat. Would this be competitive? It was relative to your solution. Mm that sorry but at least not online. Uh, in I don't think we can yeah I don't think we can talk about that one in this forum all right fair enough unfortunately armor systems are a very uh you gotta be very careful what we say online so please if if one of these questions we kind of just kind of talk offline please feel free to reach out to us uh individually and and we'll make sure to talk with you offline about this Yep, that's very, very good uh, comment on that. Thank you. All right, how about cost? How much does this system cost in price per square foot? That's an interesting question. Um, we have more information about that uh, that we could discuss with you offline, um, but some of that um, material cost um, is proprietary to hardware. A hard wire, um, so, but we can talk about it offline. Okay. 
Okay, and did you change the angle by rotating the top of the target back only or forward also? Is the direction of tumble up or down also related to the direction the target is facing or just the armor and I and at the drop and I drop you. So without getting into too much detail about the armor's construction, we were very careful to always install it the same way and always rotate it the same way while we were making our um, our angle changes, our obliquity changes. So we made sure it was very consistent, and the answer is it does matter, but we can't tell you how. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, says this next question says this seems like a very thick solution, depending on how or where it is mounted. How does the effectiveness of this solution compare to a thicker single panel of ultra high molecular weight of polyethylene in weight versus performance? How significant of an improvement is it? So it depends on, you know, this, this particular armor system is focused on a lightweight solution for AP rounds. Um, and for AP, it has a you know a very specific mechanism of defeat. So um, if you're going into different, you know, more general rounds, it may not be the right answer. But we did this so that we could understand and in and be able to make informed decisions about when this would be applicable compared to other armor solutions. Perfect. All right, next question. So what is the largest caliber of round that this could possibly be effective against? Assuming the space and thickness can vary. I'm going to guess your response, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think any specifics on calibers and rounds, we'd like to take that one offline. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, in general, our armor structures parasitic, that is not part of an aircraft structure, but added to them. Often, yes, but as a member of the structures technical area, um, when I spoke earlier about integrating this into a skin and floor structure, that would be an example where it would not be purely parasitic. Yes. That's one of the reasons that this armor system uh very appealing as well as the possibility for it to serve dual purpose of you know protecting from threats but also possibly being you know a, a durable floor as well all right uh, next question is this material export controlled i don't know the answer but i'm going to assume it's yes And Hardwire, I believe, yeah, is a U.S.-based sure. company, correct? Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah. All right. A um, couple more questions here. I appreciate everyone bearing with us. I, I, I think the questions are a valuable part of this webinar um, time. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna keep going forward until about one o'clock here and see how many questions we can get through as long as. Sarah and Delaney and John, you're going to willing to stick it, stick with us. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next question. So this development is defined under a class of armor mechanisms called tipping plates, first seen by Alex Charters in 1941. Material perforated designs appears in the 1980s that fractured the projectile. The projectile appears intact, its jacket removed. What about different nosed shapes? I'm not quite getting the connections all with the historical remark there, but um, perhaps the latter part of the question is still relevant. Is the the jacket removed? And what about nose shapes? So it very much depends on the velocity of the bullet as to what actually happens in that inner space uh, where it tumbles. And that's all I'll say on that. Okay. All right, let's keep moving on. Next question, is there any test data at cold or hot temperatures? So anywhere ranging from negative 30 to 
160 Fahrenheit? Not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Future work. All right, next question. So what is the current production rate capability for building the structures? So for example, is the system scaled for a full craft already? And is it time consuming or difficult at all to produce? You're welcome to ask Hardwire about their manufacturing. I do not know those details. Yeah. Also, I don't think we're really at a position where we should talk about all of those details as well. But Hardwire is uh, very willing to discuss a lot of these things as you approach them. Mm -hmm. We did not have any problem getting an order filled by them. That's In terms of time, we can say. timeliness, I suspect. Yes, it was it was a quick order process. Okay, well, that's good. And like you said, all their cool details can go to Hardwire for the specifics. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Are foreign countries also experimenting with anisotropic materials for armor? Probably. Yes, they are. I, I believe I saw an article about that. The, um, Sweden actually had a new um, armor system they were using for their ground soldiers that was based on um, an isotropic material. Very good. And then uh, just a quick plug for DSI. If, if any of these questions that uh, have been asked, if, if you'd like um, some more details on it, again, our, our technical inquiry research service um, it exists. It's four hours of free information research time by our staff to help get some answers to some of your questions. So this would be, you know, an example of a question that we could help dig into a little bit more. All right, so moving on to Q&A. Uh, can this armor be scaled up to stop fragment velocities used on Navy ships? So I think that uh, this armor can be scaled up theoretically to stop higher order threats and fragments. Um, a lot of it we haven't tested yet, um, so this could possibly be added on to future work as well. Okay. All right. Oh, and then follow up here from Robert Spink, RJ Spink, said uh, so a question about the MS being done, uh, just recommending um, point of contact for Adam uh, Sokolow at ARL. Thank you, RJ. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Uh, so I'm assuming Brian, that the test. Will these be I'm available sorry? like afterwards? Did I, did I need to write that down or will these be available afterwards? Oh, I guess I can look at the recording afterwards. Yeah, well, yes, and these questions are available. I'll get them to you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, next question slash comment here. I'm assuming the test used new plates. Is any data available on aged plates? So those that maybe are fatigued by material as maybe occur in high vibration installations and the impact to the performance of those. No, we don't have any data on um, aged or fielded systems for this armor. So fair to say these all the tests were done on new plates. That's correct. Yes. Yep. All right, next question. Are you concerned with any potential shatter gap issues? For this armor system, no. No. All right, short and sweet. All right, next question. For each of the tests that were performed, was each shot taken in it? Well, here we go. No, in a new set of armor panels, or were they reused? So there, we used for the V50s all fresh armor panels, and for the tumbled rounds where we took the catcher plate off and then determined the tumble rate with the high-speed cam camera, uh, some of those armor panels were shot multiple times. All right, perfect. But, but not to the point where performance would be degraded. 
Got it. Okay. And we're closing in on one o'clock, so we'll just get few through a few more questions um, that we again have in, in order as they were received. Um, I'm just looking ahead, and I do notice that we had kind of one question slide slash comment uh, from Emily at Hardwire. So I will uh, be sure to include her information um, in a kind of follow-up email and, and the, the, our webpage about this webinar. So if there's anyone who wants to contact her for more information um, about the details of the solution and ordering and, and anything else, um, that'll be provided and available. Okay, um, next question is, is there an email contact address to continue discussions? I believe on the cover slide, yes. Um, I'm not sure if my email's on the cover slide. Um, but Brian, you have my email if uh, you wanted to include that on anywhere. Yep. Yeah, you can um, can certainly contact DSI. I can I can get you in touch with Sierra and, and company. Um, and also, if you're um, have the global address list, I'm sure you can be found that way as well. All right. Next question, which groups among the armored community would you say are your target consumer? For example, A-10 close support, high altitude aerial support, or ground units? So it depends on what threat you're trying to defeat. So I, I don't really want to answer that question in this forum. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Just wanted to continue on the line. Oh, fair enough. I would suspect that since you guys were at the AVMC, you know, this may be uh, some folks could kind of think from that perspective as well. But certainly not not boxed in there. All right, how about um, any comment on incident projectile speed and mass? Nope, sorry, not in an unclassified environment. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, are these in the form of tiles? Can damaged portions be easily removed and replaced? And is in that case, what about the seam or gaps in between the tiles? So this is a construction question, and that will depend upon the actual application in question. Mm -hmm. So for typical V50 testing, we get a panel, and those can be 6 by 6 inch panels, 12 by 12 inch panels, or really whatever we specify. But typically, it's, it's in that order of size. And in an actual application scenario, these armor panels can be cut to whatever size they are needed to be. And shape. Perfect. All right, good. All right, so uh, next question here is about the repairability. What is the repairability of the armor post hit for long term use? And I suppose that gets to the last question about you know being replaced if, if they're in tile form. Um, so it depends upon the app, uh, how the armor is applied to the system, but generally speaking, once it's hit, you will want to replace that panel. Or that portion of the armor. Yep. Okay, let's jump to a few more. Is the armor effective against molten or high energy penetrators? We have not done any research against molten penetrators, so I would, I personally don't have the answer to that question. Okay. All right, let's jump to the next one. Have you looked at fire concerns for the material? I do not believe that we have. No, but that it is. A... Yeah, it's, it's ultra it high molecular weight polyethylene. So, um, yeah. you know, that, no that material has um, prescribed fire um, behavior and, and toxic fume information. <laughs> Whether it falls on that list or not, you know, it's established. Yeah, it's a well-known material. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, next question. So will the penetration characteristics change with the square footage of the plate? For example, the center impact on a two by two plate, would that be different than a six by six plate? 
In general, yes. And so that's why it's important to know your boundary conditions. Um, and when we characterize armor and uh, compare them to other armor systems, that's why we have a standard way of doing it. That's why we go through the process of creating a V50 and having a 12 inch by 12 inch panel so that when you go and look at data from another armor system, you can compare somewhat apples to apples because the performance of the armor will change with its shape and um, general size characteristics. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, we think we've got uh, essentially two more questions, so we'll just try to respond to them um, and then close out. So here we go, next one. Do you think this armor could be scaled down and applied to personal body armor? An interesting I think question. That it, I go ahead, John. doubt it considering the air gap necessary, though if um, though I won't say that it's impossible. Um, it is certainly something that can be applied to a wall. Yeah. Okay. All right, next question. I think this is our kind of last one before that final comment from Hardwire. Um, is there an interest in using a lighter weight composite armor as the backing place? I don't know if this question is referring to a backing plate on the turning block striker or in back as a catcher. And in either case, um, we haven't done any specific testing to this. So um, the, the weight of your system is going to be specifically targeted to a, a particular threat. So I would say it, it depends on what you're trying to use it for. And this is an optimization question. So generally speaking, yes, there's, there's interest in exploring uh, the different configurations uh, for this armor system. Okay, perfect. All right, I'll just leave this last Again, comment here from Emily at Hardwire up here on the screen for those who are watching it. And then I'll also be sure to include this um, on our website and, and a follow-up email to everybody who is in attendance. Uh, but that concludes our time. I appreciate everybody sticking around. And um, again, this is this will be recorded and made available. Um, if there's any questions or comments, please uh, reach out to me, Brian Benish uh, at dsiac.org. I'd be happy to, to chat more with you. Sierra, Delaney, John, thank you guys so much for the presentation and, and answering all these great questions from, from everybody. Um, thank you again for your time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate this. All right.